Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our September uh, webinar for the uh, Roads and Transport Directorate. So the topic for today's session is on uh, the new New South Wales low carbon concrete specifications. Uh, and we've got um, two uh, presenters, co-presenters here today to um, cover cover off on this topic. So we've got um, Alberto Jimenez from uh, the DCC EEW, the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water, and then Philip Vimpani from Arup. So um, Alberto and Philip, I might let you both introduce yourselves to, to our delegates today. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alberto Jimenez. Uh, I work with the Department of uh, Climate Change, Energy, Environment and, and Water. And most recently, we have been tasked with uh, developing uh, low carbon concrete uh, requirements uh, for use in procurement New South Wales government agencies and councils across New South Wales. And Philip? Yep, uh, Phil Vimpani. So I work with Arup. I'm a materials sustainability specialist and looking at um, helping industry and helping uh, government agencies working to um, adopt low carbon concrete in particular. Um, across across their work. I've been working with Alberto on the program for the last uh, 12, 15 months, um, looking at how we can um, change New South Wales government agencies to accommodate low carbon concrete. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for coming along today. Um, we really appreciate taking time out of your day to, to present on this topic. Um, yeah, we're very here, keen to hear on um, where the project's up to and, and sort of what level of engagement you're looking for from, from local government. So um, I'll hand over to you both to, to run the slides now and then I'll jump back on towards the end for some Q&A. Thank you, Josh. And Philip, if you could um, share your screen. Perfect. Thank you. So yes, as I mentioned, um, I work with the New South Wales government and most recently we were tasked with uh, developing requirements for low carbon concrete and uh, to support the implementation of these low carbon concrete requirements within uh, New South Wales government agencies and councils across New South Wales, noting that in the absence of a strategy or mandate to reduce and manage embodied carbon, a lot of these initiatives in councils and um, agencies are on a voluntary space as of now. Um, having said that, uh, as part of the development of these specifications, uh, we work closely with uh, the Arab team um, who as a technical partner uh, have helped us um, engage industry uh, to develop these low carbon concrete requirements. So. I'm here today with uh, two messages for you. The first one is that, um, yes, as I've noticed, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, very few councils across New South Wales have mandates um, or detailed mandates to work on scope three emissions, but this is a growing area and we see a growing number of councils across New South Wales um, kind of starting to uh, gain some interest around how to reduce embodied carbon emissions and the the role that material selection and more specifically low carbon concrete may have in this part. Now, uh, next two slides, next slide. Um, so yes, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional uh, custodians of the lands where we work and live. Um, we pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging. Philip, just briefly, could you just hit on um, uh, full screen mode? I think we're still seeing the... Uh, I'll just share the other slide on the screen. Thanks. No worries. Yeah, let me know if that's working. Thank you. Yeah, it's... Yeah, all good. Thank you. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so with the aim of facilitating the adoption of low carbon concrete requirements, uh, our program developed a set of um, low carbon concrete requirements, as well as uh, a lot of uh, fact sheets, guidance, and and uh, even a faction of frequently asked questions. So as part of the process, we've gathered a lot of information, which I think will be very useful in the implementation. Uh, next, next slide, please. Yep. 
I'm still seeing the same. Yeah, it hasn't moved across. Uh, so while we do that, uh, just wanted to reiterate the message that um, if you are a council currently exploring the role of low carbon concrete and how to uh, procure low carbon concrete, uh, the message for me from for me is uh, you're probably not alone. There is an emerging, growing, and growing number of councils across New South Wales who are uh, now starting to manage scope three emissions and are looking at the implementation of low carbon concrete. And I know many of them have questions around the availability of these low carbon concrete products in their local areas. Um, you know, what are the potential um, impacts to uh, operations and uh, the performance of low carbon concrete. So uh, I would like to pass it to Philip Bimpani, uh, who would be providing a lot of um, the, all the information that we have gathered uh, on these key issues. Yeah, Phil? sure. Thanks, Alberto. Um, I'll just uh, quickly talk about the agenda and I might pass it back to you to talk about policy stuff after this. Um, so um, so basically what we're wanting to try and cover today is just talking about what low carbon concrete is, um, how it's been, um, how we're sort of adopting it as part of the New South Wales Low Emissions Program, um, what the opportunities we see are for adopting low carbon concrete um, in industry and what are the capabilities that we've identified from industry in using low carbon concrete? Um, and then what are some of the considerations that might need to be undertaken in using low carbon concrete? Um, we'll go through some of the specifications and fact sheets that we've created for councils, um, talk through some case studies that we've had, and then potentially have um, a conversation at the end about Q&A. So um, yeah, so I'll hand it back to you about policy, Alberto. Yeah, uh, in the absence of, uh like a mandatory policy or strategy, uh, we do see the emergence of the Infrastructure New South Wales decarbonizing infrastructure delivery policy, uh, which kind of asks uh, New South Wales government agencies to uh, measure their body carbon performance. Um, and it is now we start seeing uh, large infrastructure agencies across New South Wales who are large users of low emissions building materials. And we start seeing them have a lot of interest in how to manage embodied carbon. And I think one of the benefits for that would be um, the kind of the, 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 the maturity of, uh, of the sector, the growing maturity in the sector, making it easier for um, other agencies and councils across New South Wales to measure and procure low carbon concrete. Um, my hope is that there will be a growing number of councils who make the transition to procuring low carbon concrete products um, in the future. Philip? Right. Um, so what is embodied carbon? Um, so some of you will probably have a really good understanding of what embodied carbon is and others may not be as clear. Um, so embodied carbon is the, the carbon that's required for materials that are used in infrastructure or buildings. Um, and it includes the sort of development of those materials or the mining or the, the sort of transportation of those materials, um, the, the energy that's required for the construction of the materials. Um, also the sort of carbon that's required for um, doing any maintenance um, to the to the facilities and then any carbon that is associated with the deconstruction and demolition um, of, of those materials. So embodied carbon doesn't include for energy use or during the operation of the facilities um, and, and any water use as well. So it's really all associated with the materials that are that are involved in um, building infrastructure, um, and and the carbon cost of that. So we're talking today particularly about concrete and why are we talking about concrete? Well, in summary, it's just we use so much concrete. That, that's really the bottom line. Um, and concrete is used in, in a lot of applications. Um, they, they've estimated that 7% of global CO2 emissions um, are from concrete. So that's a huge percentage. And why is it important to us? Well, we can make a huge difference in the amount of carbon that is used in concrete. Other materials are a lot harder to abate, the amount of carbon, 
but concrete, we can make a big difference relatively easily with very minimal impacts. Um, and so that's why we're having this conversation today because there's big opportunities in what can be implemented. Um, just for information, the, the amount of cement in concrete is around about 16%. Uh, it's a relatively small component. Um, it's the binding material that binds all the mat other materials in concrete together. But cement is 93% of the carbon cost in concrete. So it's a huge proportion of the amount of carbon that's used in concrete. So when we're talking about low carbon concrete, really what we're focusing on is reducing the amount of cement in concrete. And we can do that by a range of different ways. Um, you know, it's projected that the amount of concrete that's going to be used in industry is going to be increasing every year um, moving forward. So unless we make um, a significant um, significant impact to the amount of carbon that's used in concrete, then we're going to be increasing our um, carbon emissions moving forward. So what is low carbon concrete? And it's, it's a very it's a very simple and a very difficult answer um, to provide because everyone has a different definition. So we we just adopt a high level definition which looks at um, it's concrete which has got um, other materials that replace the amount of ordinary Portland cement. Now that might be um, for one project that might be thirty percent of the amount of Portland cement that's replaced. Other projects, it might be 60, 70, or even 80% of the amount of Portland cement. And you can, you know, you can have other geopolymer concretes that don't have any Portland cement at all. So it's, um, so rather than putting a figure, um, it's just a generic, uh, generic definition. So when we're talking about reducing the amount of concrete, um, or reducing the amount of carbon in concrete, uh, there's a whole lot of different avenues where that can occur. Um, some of them can be done by the suppliers of cement or the suppliers of concrete in how they manufacture those materials. Um, what sort of energy do they use to manufacture the materials? We're not really going to be focusing on that because all of that stuff is upstream. It's done by um, suppliers. Um, what we can change in our specifications is um, how we use concrete. So that's what the focus of our conversations are going to be about today. So it's reducing the cement in concrete. So what are the opportunities we've got to try and reduce cement? So we can um, change, we can incorporate carbon reduction targets for the amount of concrete, uh, amount of carbon that concrete provides. And that is a, a great way of um, reducing the carbon cost. And we have done this um, on many different applications and, you know, potentially, you know, have incorporated, you know, 30, 40, 50, um, or even up to 60% carbon reductions in the concrete that's provided. We can nominate that different um, materials like fly ash and blast furnace slag are adopted in place of cement, and we can nominate replacement levels. Um, and this is something else that is done quite frequently. Um, there's a lot of benefits of using this because it's very simple, very easy to understand, um, but the industry is moving very quickly in quantifying what the carbon carbon levels of different concrete mixes are. And so we're at a point where we can you know, potentially um, adopt a carbon reduction targets pretty widely. Um, there's, there's other opportunities to adopt manufactured sand rather than virgin sand. Um, this is, doesn't necessarily provide a huge carbon reduction, but it's, it's great for re preserving um, materials. So we can use recycling of existing concrete and um, to use it as an aggregate in new concrete. And this is something that's being adopted very widely by industry. Um, if you go and go to your local concrete supplier and you order concrete for a house slab, it's going to have recycled concrete aggregate um, as part of that. So it's something that we should be doing um, more, you know, far more widely in all the concrete that we're using. Um, there's opportunities in certain markets, in certain regions to use crushed slag aggregate, um, particularly in areas which are associated with or close to um, steel mills and, and, um, and areas where slag crushed or slag aggregate is produced. There's opportunities to recycle plastics in certain applications. Um, there is a risk 
that um, that leaching can occur in, in waterways and, and water type applications. So we wouldn't be suggesting that be adopted in in those applications, but in um, in confined buildings and things like that, there's opportunities for that. Um, there's geopolymer um, and alkali activated materials that can be adopted. And I mentioned that that geopolymer concrete can have full replacement of all Portland cement. So it can achieve very low carbon levels. Um, but, you know, we can also get 80% carbon concrete, 80% um, SCM replacement in concrete as well. So, you know, geopolymer is is one opportunity, um, but very high um, reductions in um in, in Portland cement can also be achieved using, you know, fly ash and slag. And uh, calcine clay, which um, people are saying may be the future of um, concrete um, when the supply of fly ash and slag is not available. Um, calcine clay is a widely available material that can be adopted and there's um, a, a growing um, level of um, development of use of calcine clay in Australia. It's been used overseas um, for 20 or 30 years, but it hasn't been used in Australia. And now we've sort of got a strong need to move to other sustainable materials um, as the supply of fly ash and slag is starting to reduce. And calcine clay is definitely a material that is being considered for doing that. Um, just looking at the embodied carbon level of different materials, so cement um, is generally sort of, you know, around about a thousand tons of CO2 per thousand, um, thousand kilograms of CO2 per tonne. Um, and it's, it's quite high. Um, slag is significantly lower, um, but fly ash is, is much lower again. Um, calcine clay is a little bit higher than fly ash, but um, the availability of fly ash is very limited. The reason why it's, um, so low is that it's considered a by byproduct of the the um, the coal fire industry uh, for um, yeah, producing coal. So um, it doesn't have an anybody carbon um, except for transporting it from the from the actual plants. Right. Um, so looking at what concrete suppliers are doing and what they're what they're adopting. So the main three concrete suppliers in the industry are Borrell, Hanson and Holsom. Those three suppliers own a whole range of smaller suppliers that are supplying to local markets all around the state and the country. And um, basically, you know, those suppliers are, uh, you know, supplying a huge portion of the market, either under those names or under other names. Um, they have... Um, proprietary materials which they um, offer in high levels of SEM replacement and those material those materials um, achieve very good performance so we um, they they sort of market um, some of their products as premium products on the basis that they can achieve very high early age strengths while still achieving all the other durability and performance requirements uh, needed. So really, if you want to achieve or you need to achieve high early strength um, in your mixes, you can do so. You have to pay extra for it. If you don't need to achieve high early strength, if you can accommodate, you know, around about 80% of what you might have as an early age strength, um, sort of in 24 hours or up to three days, um, then you can use their more standard products, which have a much lower cost premium um, or a cost neutral. So um, the, we generally recommend that for critical elements that are on a critical path, you might want to use their premium products, but for all other concrete, um, using their standard products um, can achieve s s almost equivalent outcomes apart from early age strength. So, um, yeah, so, so we, we've found that, you know, 80% of concrete, um, depending on the project, but 80 to 90% of concrete on a project can use their standard products um, and it's only where you've got a critical need that you have to use the products that are slightly more expensive. Um, these, these materials are being widely used in industry. Um, there's a whole lot of mixes that have been developed for um, transport for New South Wales and that are approved for use. Um, I'm just providing that as background information, um, just so that people understand that we're we're talking about things that are widely used 
by industry, widely used by road authorities um, and widely used by um, other infrastructure organisations. Um, how do these requirements for these mixes interface with standards? Um, so AS3600, um, there's, there's no specific requirement as to the level of SEM replacement that you can adopt and it's open to, to use any level that you want to as long as you achieve the performance requirements that you need to. So, so AS3600 doesn't, doesn't um, constraints in using high SEM concrete. Um, AS3600 also refers to AS1379, which is the concrete supply standard, and that doesn't uh, nominate uh, particular levels of SEMs that can be adopted. AS5100, which is the bridge design standard, um, that nominates limits as to the levels of SEM that can be adopted. However, those limits are quite high. So, you know, you can, you can achieve um, around about sort of 60% you know, replacement without any significant issue. Um, they do also allow for you to adopt higher levels of replacement than are nominated in these, in these um, standards, um, but you just need to demonstrate that you're going to achieve the performance requirements that are, that are nominated. So, and particularly, you know, if there are requirements associated with early age strength prior to stripping um, that you achieve those sort of early age strength requirements. Um, Guide to residential pavements, there's no requirements with regards to levels of SEMs, so there's no restrictions on the amount of SEM that can be used, used on those, those standard. And residential slabs and footings, again, there's no restrictions on the amount of SEMs that can be adopted. Right, so when we've been working um, with DQ in um, identifying what opportunities there are for using SEMs um, in industry, so particularly looking at the council, different council market, um, what, uh, when we've been looking at what the opportunities might be, um, we've sort of identified a bit of a pragmatic approach to specifying requirements. And um, I think I've got a slide. Yeah, I'll, I'll just talk to this slide. So, so what we've done is we've nominated both the levels of SCM replacement that um, would be required to be adopted as minimum requirements. And we've also included information on the levels of carbon reduction that would be adopted. So we're providing an opportunity for councils to either use SCM replacement as their requirements or carbon reduction as their requirements. And the reason why we've gone through a joint system is that on, on some projects, which are quite small, there may not be any sustainability personnel involved in the project. It might just be delivered by a local contractor who just wants to go out there, order some concrete and do the work. And so we've provided the opportunity for them to nominate, um, to identify what SCM replacements they can, they can specify um, without um, necessarily looking at the carbon reduction requirements. I will say, however, that the industry is moving very quickly to providing carbon reduction information or carbon information on many mixes that they have available. And I think that we'll be in a position within the next 12 months um, where we'll be able to just nominate carbon reduction requirements. Uh, we would be recommending that any reasonable size project that you adopt the carbon reduction targets um, rather than the um, SEM replacement levels. Um, we have also nominated um, what the assumed um, minimum um, levels of minimum maximum levels of cement um, that are adopted in the concrete um, so that people can understand what the reduction targets are based on. So we've sort of nominated um, both what the percentage reductions are and, and also how to um, how to establish what the carbon, original carbon levels are. And we've included requirements for demonstrating compliance and that sort of thing as well. Okay, yeah, so this slide just provides the detail of what I've just talked about. Um, we're, we're typically looking at a 50% SEM reduction target um, or a 40% carbon reduction target um, as a level. There's an opportunity to have higher reductions um, on cast in situ concrete elements compared to precast. Um, we found that precasters aren't necessarily able to achieve quite as high levels of SEM replacement as what you can do when you do cast in situ concrete. And particularly for things like piles, there's huge opportunity to use high levels of SEM replacement um, in, uh, in casting piles. Um, 
There's also opportunities for using alternative materials and we've nominated requirements for using manufactured sand and then an, um, for a small portion of projects um, or for a small portion of elements on a project to adopt other materials such as recycled aggregate, um, geopolymer concrete, crust slag aggregate or other um, other alternatives that can be considered. So. Um, we've provided for DQ a whole lot of fact sheets that are uh, available to industry, and uh, I'd imagine that um, Alberto will be able to share these with you um, after the meeting. Um, these fact sheets talk through how to calculate what um, embodied carbon is in a mix if you want to use that approach, um, just how to implement low carbon concrete, um, what is some of the materials, what is manufactured sand, um, what is slag aggregate? What is recycled concrete aggregate? What sort of percentage levels can you adopt in in concrete? Um, what are some of the, what are supp supplementary cementitious materials? And then we've we've included a fact sheet also with a whole lot of frequently asked questions. And this is a really useful fact sheet because it it goes through and and talks through some of the concerns that people have raised, and then talks through how those things um, have been addressed by industry or can be addressed in delivering projects. So it's a very, very useful document to, to look through. And um, yeah, if you're gonna look at any of the fact sheets, the frequently asked questions would be the one I would uh, jump to first. Um, we, I've, in this presentation, I do have some of the frequently asked questions um, and I'll, I'll talk through them a little later. Um, but, you know, some of the concerns are, you know, can you achieve supply of these uh, low carbon concretes in regional areas. And we've noticed a huge change in the last five years in the level of availability of low carbon concretes in regional areas. We find that sometimes you might have one supplier that can supply low carbon concrete in a, in a local regional market and the other suppliers can't do it. Um, or in other regional areas, all of the suppliers can supply low concrete car low carbon concrete. Um, there might be some areas in, in more remote locations where your supplier can't uh, provide low carbon concrete, but we have had um, conversations with all of the national managers from these, these suppliers, and they've said that they've got funding available to move any of these plants to low carbon concrete if there's um, a, a demand from industry to, to use it. So. They've, um, they've said that it's not a problem to do, to change any plant to low carbon concrete if there's a if there's gonna be use of that material, um, they just need time. So they've indicated that in you know regional and rural areas, they need about six months to upgrade a plant. Um, so they just need that advanced notification um, to, to change a plant. Um, so I've indicated sort of some of the costs in high SEM um, concrete so generally, if you don't need it high early strength, your cost is very close to neutral. We've actually had cost savings on projects in metropolitan areas. Um, in, in regional areas, we might be talking about a 5 or 10% cost increase um, unless you need high strength. So that's just the cost of the concrete. Obviously, you know, some of these concretes have really good properties, really good performance. They have lower levels of shrinkage. Um, so, you know, you're potentially saving on cracking risks and other sorts of issues. So, um, you, you know, some people have used lower amounts of reinforcement to control cracking. Um, so, you know, often the cost increases are marginal or, or none. Um, impact of SEMs on design life. Um, so, SEMs have been specified by AS 5100 for quite a while, for the past 30 or 40 years. And the reason why they've been specified in, in high risk, more aggressive environments is because they improve the durability performance of concrete. So they, they, they reduce the amount of deterioration mechanisms. Um, it does provide generally a better outcome. The only uh, area of concern is associated with carbonation of your concrete, which is the reaction of carbon dioxide um, with your with your concrete matrix. And there's a whole lot of testing that's being done, and basically it's identified that high levels of SEM up to sort of seventy percent um, will not impact on the design life of your concrete associated with carbonation, um, and. It, and that is also not an issue for any underground elements. So it's only areas in the atmosphere where that's a, con that's a concern. And you can just follow the Australian standards 
and use higher CM concretes and there's not a not an issue. Um, so can higher CM concretes achieve required early age strengths? Definitely. Um, but you need to pay extra for it. So um, that's that's something that you know there's been a lot of development over the last 10 years by concrete suppliers because that was a, that was one of the fundamental things holding back the use of high SEM concretes um, that's been addressed through technical development and now you can achieve concrete um, with 50 percent replacement that has exactly the same early age strength once you're talking about 70 percent SEM replacement there might be some minor reduction in strength but it's pretty minor um, for those concretes um, so are there, what are the temperature restrictions for placing concrete high SEM? There, there aren't any temperature restrictions. It, it works exactly the same as normal um, normal concrete. So there's no issues there. And um, consistency and availability and market capacity of SEMs. Look, these materials are widely available in the market now. There was a couple of issues during COVID where there were some supply constraints, but they're, they're widely available now and they will be for the next few years um, in a period of more than five years, we envisage there'll be start to be um, supply constraints. And um, after about 10 years, we think there'll be there'll be cost impacts that will be fairly significant in the use of um, these materials. So there's a whole range of new materials that are being looked at. And I'm, I mentioned uh, calcine clay is one of them. Okay. So, um, so why would you why would you move to um, low carbon concrete? Well, obviously the fundamental reason is to reduce the environmental impact. Um, so that, that's, you know, that's, you can, as I said, you can get a 40% carbon reduction very easily in um, specifying low carbon concrete. Um, it, it also improves durability. Um, there, there's, you know, as we've discussed previously, um, there's a whole range of different performance measures which require the use of high SEM concrete to mitigate durability risks. Um, one of the things we're seeing more and more is alkali sil silica reactivity of aggregates um, because a lot of the really high performing aggregates have been used and so the suppliers are having to turn to their B grade aggregates which are a lot more reactive um, using using SEMs mitigate um, deterioration of aggregates. So it's it's you know, it's also reducing the potential for problems. Um, so road authorities specify if you do have reactive aggregates um, that you have to use um, reasonably high levels of SEMs to mitigate that. For a lot of council projects, we don't do testing of the aggregates, so we don't know whether they're reactive. So it's just good practice to adopt SEMs irrespective um, so that that is mitigated, and that's the that's the approach that's adopted in Queensland, and that they do for all of their road infrastructure. They just nominate that every every project has SEMs um, to reduce the risk of alkali silica reactivity, and there's no increase in um, maintenance costs. Um, if anything, the maintenance costs of high SEM concrete is less than regular concrete because of its improved durability. Okay. Um, so this is just providing some information on the life of, um, of, S of concretes with high SEMs and the impact on carbonation. And um, this is a study that's been done just to look at the impact of um, the carbonation risk. And in um, the level of cover that's required in low aggressive environments is, is the lowest. So that's basically, you know, A2, A, B1. And um, this table basically shows that, you know, um, within a 50 year life or a hundred year life that you are not going to impact on your durability performance associated with carbonation. Um, so, what are some of the limitations in, in why aren't we everyone using high SEM concrete? Well, the first one is that, you know, up until five years ago, there was a, a barrier with the um, adoption of high early age strength and you couldn't achieve high early age strength. So applications such as pre-stressing beams, such as, um, you know, critical locations um, or road closures and those sort of things, it was, it was problematic to use. So it wasn't really widely adopted. It, there's also, you know, people just do what they what they know, um, and so people have, you know, just kept doing the same thing that they've been doing for the last twenty years, and um, 
you know, people don't like generally to change. So there is a potential for a slight increase in cost, but, you know, to be honest, um, we've found that that cost is pretty meaning, pretty minor. And it's, it's not common that you need to need to get high early age strength. Um, so that the, you know, potentially cost increase is less than 5% of the concrete supply. Um, there is some differences in workability. There's differences in requirements um, for things like slump, for example. Um, so if you provide high early, if you provide high SEM concrete with the same level of slump as you do if you regular concrete, it's just not going to be able to be placed. It will be very difficult to work. Um, you need to have significantly higher slumps for high SEM concrete. So, so rather than having a slump of say 80 or 100 mil, you need to have 180 or 200 mil slump um, to achieve the same level of placement ability. So people need to be aware of that and need to specify the, the difference requirements. And then, you know, some, some specifications and some requirements either have perceived barriers that you can't use a particular concrete type or, you know, actual barriers in the levels that you can provide. So as I've indicated previously, that's, that, that limitation is pretty much not a limitation. Um, and for all the sort of applications that we'll be typically talking about, there's no real barriers in using high SEM concrete. Um, so as I indicated, your high SEM concrete can have a minor cost impact. So supply, um, contractors won't use it if there is a minor cost increase. So it needs to be specified that you adopt high SEM concrete. Um, even if it's a 1% cost reduction, they will go for the regular concrete um, if it's not specified. So it needs to be specified in, in the, the documents, um, in the specification and procurement requirements. Um, needs, we need to um, be aware of what the limitations are in regional and rural areas and work with suppliers to enable the supply of um, high SEM concrete to be achieved. Now that might be proactive engagement um, with suppliers to identify that you know, you've got a project coming up or you want to be able to use this, this, high, this material in six months time, um, what can be done to, to upgrade their plants to allow that to occur and verification that what is being provided is um, achieving the outcomes. Um, you don't want to spend all this time and effort and then the information that's provided by the contractor doesn't demonstrate that you're achieving the suitable reductions in carbon. Um, I've provided some information on um, performance requirements and durability. Um, basically, as, as we've discussed, um, if you follow the Australian standards requirements, you're going to achieve your performance and durability requirements. Um, but you know, early age strength is is something that maybe you might want to or need to consider what the performance requirements that need to be achieved um, for that sort of application. Um, conc concrete workability, early age strength, obviously they're important for stripping times, for transport of materials. So all those things need to be considered. Um, training of staff needs to be undertaken who are going to be applying the concrete to make sure they know how to 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 apply the concrete and finish it properly and the sort of time frames for doing so. And um, there's no issues with compatibility of high SCM concrete with normal concrete or OPC concrete. Um, they, they, they behave in the same way. You can use repair materials that don't have SCMs and it will achieve the same performance outcomes. So, so um, the reason why high SCM concretes have been able to achieve um, the, the performance requirements that are needed by industry is that admixtures um, are provided or supplied to with the concretes that achieve those outcomes. So the sorts of admixtures that we're talking about are largely associated with improving early age strength, um, but they're also admixtures associated with reducing the shrinkage of the concrete um, to achieve a low shrinkage outcomes. So um, yeah, so that's that can be provided by concrete suppliers all, all across New South Wales. Um, so there's a lot of people that are focusing on ensuring that they're adopting low carbon concrete. Um, I'm involved in a working group at the moment with Ausroads, which is looking at trying to increase the level of SEMs that are nominated for all state road authorities around the country and also New Zealand. 
and we're currently providing uh, preparing a working paper for that um, so that uh, the level of SEMs and the level of carbon reduction in road infrastructure is uh, significantly increased. Um, ACT government has just gone through a process for updating all their specifications um, for adopting high levels of SEM replacement and Queensland Main Roads is currently um, doing the same thing. They're, they're achieving some pretty good outcomes with regards to the level of SEM replacement. Um, Sydney Water has been um, looking at this area for the last few years and they are nominating SEM replacement as part of their concrete mixes. Um, they're still on a journey and they're looking at um, trying to incorporate that more widely across all of their concretes that they're adopting, but they're, they're including for you know up to 60% SEM replacement in their, their concrete. Um, they have no nominated um, the level of maximum cementitious level in the concretes um, and the maximum body carbon levels as well. So the setting maximum cementitious content is an important uh, metric uh, because otherwise people can just increase the total binder, which is OPC and SEM. And they might say, oh, we've got 20% or 30% or 40% of SEM but we haven't really reduced the amount of cement, of OPC cement in the concrete. So they just end up with a whole lot more cementitious material than they need to. And um, it provides for minimal or doesn't provide for the carbon benefits that you need. So you need to nominate maximum cementitious contents as well. Uh, Sydney Metro, I would say these guys are a leader in the industry for adopting high levels of SEM replacement. They are... Um, have been rolling out since 2020 um, generic um, requirements for high SEM replacement. Now you can see here that the levels that they're adopting for larger elements of 50% fly ash or 70% slag or, or sort of equivalent carbon reduction saving um, for a tertiary blend with both those materials is very high. Um, and we haven't nominated the same sort of level of replacement as what they've adopted on their projects, but they're able to achieve you know, very large um, SEM reductions and carbon reductions on their projects. So um, it's a really good outcome. Um, and they're using all the main concrete suppliers to deliver these projects. And we're, we're talking about you know, the, major, the major infrastructure projects in New South Wales, such as you know, the, um, the airport link and, and all of the, um, the tunneling projects that they're doing at the moment. Um, it's not just it's not just um, rail projects where they're using high levels of SEM. Um, basically, the entire um, area of Barangaroo has been built at a high SEM concrete. All the projects in the last five to eight years have very high levels of SEM. Um, they have originally started off at thirty percent SEM, and they've all moved to fifty to sixty percent SEM um, over the last few years. So they've been able to build these projects with you know, multi-storey um, developments with pre-stressing beams, with very tight um, turnaround times for each floor um, with, with high SEM concrete. Um, uh, this is just some information on the types of strengths that can be achieved from 40 MPA concrete. So you can see that they can get around about 17, 17 MPA at 24 hours. Um, and for 50 MPA concrete, you can sort of get in the low 20s um, of, of that sort of strength. So, you know, for most applications, that's a pretty pretty good outcome. Um, and it's been used in other sort of infrastructure element um, type elements as well, not just not just buildings and and rail infrastructure. Um, the the rail sector does, however, have a whole lot of really good documents for using um, and reusing materials, um, high SEM materials in um, pipes and and drainage infrastructure. And I think you know, some of that information would be useful um, for um, the, the council and uh, you know, other industries. So this document, you can search up online, recycled and reuse material opportunities in rail projects. Um, you can look that up yourself. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, that's all I had to cover. So um, I'll hand it back uh, to Josh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Philip. Um, and thanks, Alberto, as well, for the presentation. Um, Philip, would you mind just, yeah, stop sharing your screen and then... Uh, oh, yeah. yep.
Yeah, all good. Um, so, yeah, look, any questions and answers from our uh, attendees today? I did see there's a couple in there, so I'll um, I'll read those out because I know that, uh, that, that those of you who are watching aren't able to turn on your mics. Um, but if you do have any questions, please pop them in either the Q&A or the chat. Uh, so there's two questions here from Stuart Small. Um, uh, are we able to share the slides after today? Are you gentlemen happy for us to share, distribute the slides after today? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, noting as well that this session is being recorded, and so um, you know you can you can access the recording and the information attached to it uh, on our website uh, once it's uploaded later today. Um, the other question was, how are the highest slumps achieved? Is it is this through water? No, it's not through water. <laughs> um, so adding adding a whole lot of extra water reduces the durability performance of your concrete. So you need to add, add additives to your your concrete that that make the concrete more liquid. So um, those additives will provide you with a concrete that's that's basically more runny. Um, so there's you can you can have concrete that is basically like soup. Um, but it has the same amount of water in it as conventional concrete. So it's just adding those additives in the right concentrations to increase the slump. Um, you don't add extra water. Don't, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Thanks for that. Um, look, I guess a, a question from mine or maybe just for the information of... Um, of our members so i know there's been a fair well there's been a degree of consultation with councils across the state to date um and i think alberta you're saying there's what been nine or so councils that you've engaged with so are you able to give us a, maybe a brief overview of sort of that process and where that's up to yeah so we're currently as we develop the specifications we're now currently uh, supporting councils across new south wales with the implementation uh, so in that we have a pilot project we are engaging nine councils uh, across different parts of New South Wales uh, and we are providing some kind of um, consulting support. So we do a mapping of um, how do we uh, implement the specifications within the operations of that council and then the ROP team provides a bit of a kind of tailored recommendation. Um, and followed up by a couple of facilitated workshops with the broader team. So we have sustainability teams, procurement engineers, um, and others. Uh, and the aim is to support the implementation of the specifications. Uh, we might potentially expand uh, the project to other councils next year. Uh, but as of now, we're working with uh, nine, nine councils. Okay. And so are you looking, if you do expand that, will you be looking for expressions of interest or how are you going Correct. to... Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, no worries. Well, if you go down that route, please let us know and we're happy yeah. to distribute them. Absolutely. Um, so look, I, I guess the other piece, which I don't know if you're happy to, to maybe just touch on it briefly, is I understand that this the, the training sort of happening on a organisation by organisation basis at the moment, but the intent is that after that stage of the project's finished, um, you'd be looking to sort of create, uh, I guess, a self-paced type module, which, you know, I think we've, we've had some discussions as to whether if we will be able to, to host that, which we're certainly uh, open to, so. Correct, and we were also looking, how can we best uh, embed the specifications within the ecosystem in which councils operate? So we're also working with uh, a NAT spec uh, in that sense, to be able to reference the specifications in their documentation. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, look, um, I haven't seen any more questions pop up, so we might wrap it up there and we'll finish a little bit early. But um, thank you both very much for your time today and um, particularly for, you know, covering so much information uh, in, in such a short amount of time. Um, noting that, yes, if people do want more information, we'll, we'll share both the recording and the slides after today and obviously um, links to the uh, specific applications themselves. So... We'll, we'll disseminate that um, out to our membership um, within the next week or so. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much again for, for your attendance today. Um, our next webinar will be uh, towards the end of October, off the top of my head, I think it's the, the, the 23rd of October, uh, on, on, on the Wednesday, normal, normal time. Um, we're still locking down the exact uh, subject for that webinar, so we're not able to share the specifics of that at the moment, but it will be coming out um, in the very near future as well. So thank you again to Alberta, thank you to Philip, and thank you to everyone for attending today.
Thank you. Thanks very much.